Good evening, and uh, welcome to Hampshire College lecture series on uh, science and religion. Uh, this is our 17th lecture in our series, which is now in its fifth year. Uh, but before I introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Margaret Race, I want to thank our sponsors, Hampshire College uh, Integrated Science and Humanities Initiative, Office of the President, Office of the Dean of Faculty, Schools of Cognitive Science, Natural Science and Humanities, and Cultural Studies. As usual, our lecture is being uh, recorded, and we will then post uh, the video on our website, scienceandreligion.hampshire.edu, scienceandreligion, one word, dot Hampshire, dot edu. Okay, so the uh, topic of extraterrestrials, the topic today, easily captures the imagination, the attention of popular audience. Uh, it can be attested by the popularity of uh, Klaatu from uh, The Day the Earth uh, That Stood Still uh, to Spielberg's friendly E.T. Uh, and even, if you think about it, uh, the relatively mediocre remake of War of the Worlds, um, which starred uh, Tom Cruise, but then it also brings in the Scientology connection, which also brings in the extraterrestrial. So, so anyway, so there are a bunch of these connections that uh, come in. However, often when we think about uh, extraterrestrials, we think about intelligent beings. And uh, Carl Sagan, for example, uh, was looking for benevolent extraterrestrials that are coming in and that will bring us Encyclopedia Galactica, holding all this information. And more recently, Stephen Hawking, uh, was also scaring us from the alien invasion. Like, you know, and said, well, stop looking for aliens out there because uh, they may be uh, not so nice to us. So we don't know what we're going to get. Uh, however, uh, our speaker today, Margaret Race, grapple with some of the questions that are more likely to happen, and that is the detection of perhaps microbial, extraterrestrial microbes on places like Mars, or Jupiter's moon Europa under the oceans over there. The question that comes in, how do we think even about microbial life that, is not, that does not belong to this planet? So far, the only biology we know of belongs to this Earth. But what if we find even one like, extra microbe somewhere else? What do we do about that? Should we bring the samples back home? Do we have a right to be on Mars if the microbes are on Mars? Or does Mars belong to Martians, even if they are microbial, even if they are tiny? So our speaker today grapples with these questions. She's a senior research scientist at the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, can I say how cool it is to be working at Institute which searches for extraterrestrial intelligence and in fact I've already gotten some requests for Star Trek questions towards the end of the talk so I don't know but it's kind of very cool to introduce somebody who's from the SETI Institute. Uh, her work focuses on scientific, technical, legal and societal issues of ensuring that missions to Mars and other solar system bodies do not either inadvertently bring uh, terrestrial microbes along which would complicate our search for indigenous extraterrestrial life, or return any microbes to Earth. Her interest in extraterrestrial organisms is linked closely to her long-term ecological research on exotic and invasive species. She is also actively involved in education and public outreach about astrobiology. Since her uh, early work with the Environmental Protection Agency as a public information specialist and her tenure at San Francisco television station KQED, Dr. Race has had a strong interest in the communication of science via the mass media. She especially likes to work with uh, journalists and educators as they develop materials about com complex, controversial issues in space exploration and environmental protection. She also had a fruitful session, I think, with students, some of the students here at Hampshire College, and, uh, and that I think we can add that, that you know, the interaction with the students also as part of the thing. Uh, and this is from her, en her enthusiasm is infectious, and her work ensures that our spacecraft won't be. Please <laughs> welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Margaret Race. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's great. Hi there. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am delighted to be here. And before I came, except to the uh, invitation, I looked up Hampshire College, and I am in the right place. Mm -hmm. The notion of having an interdisciplinary focus on what you're doing is really. Um, looking forward to a lot of the issues that we have, whether it's in science or society, law, um, 
and many other topics. So what I want to talk about today is astrobiology and space missions in the solar system. I am somebody who's actually a marine biologist by training and I sometimes pinch myself when I think about working for NASA because I didn't set out to do, do this. Um, when I started uh, as a marine biologist, the work I was doing had to do with uh, introduced species in San Francisco Bay. The mud snails that I worked on came by Transcontinental Railroad. So San Francisco Bay has exotic species that have spread and um, cause problems for the native species. And no matter where you live in this earth, you know that there are questions about invasive species, problems that are caused by them ecologically, economically, infectious. And so it stands to reason when we go to another planet, we would want to think about what it is that we're bringing back and whether or not it could cause problems. So when I was working at University of California, the questions had to do with the deliberate outdoor release of a genetically engineered organism. Here's a really far out way to think about um, introduced species, and I thought that was as far out as it would go. How do you do an impact statement when this is an organism that has never before been seen on Earth? You made it in a lab. Step forward another 10 years, how do you do an impact statement when you're talking about bringing back microbes from another planet? Something you have a lot of unknowns about, there's a lot of uncertainty, and truly unknowables. So, this is where astrobiology fits in. The part that I uh, approach is very much an implementation and an operational one. So the concepts of astrobiology are way bigger than what I work on, but I have to understand all these questions too. Astrobiology is really just the study of a life in the universe, and we're trying to figure out the puzzle of where did life come from? What are, what are we doing here? How are we all related? And each of us is trying to figure out that puzzle from a different perspective. There are astronomers, there are geochemists, cosmologists, astrophysicists, and biologists, paleontologists. And we're each figuring out that puzzle one piece at a time. And I use my biological methods to, to ask questions, and others use their methods. And what we're doing it scientifically, piece by piece by piece, and trying to figure it out, what does it all mean? What is the meaning of life? Where did it come from, and where is it going? So I'm giving you an ecologist perspective today, a very interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary perspective for sure about astrobiology and searches for extraterrestrial life. And I've divided the talk into two parts. The first part is to look at what we search for and where we search for it. And, the, and in that, I also want to talk about how we explore and responsible exploration. That's the topic of planetary protection, which is what I work on. Um, I work at the SETI Institute, but my funding comes entirely from NASA's Office of Planetary Protection. And there is a NASA Planetary Protection Officer, and she is a microbiologist. And she signs off on, um, on launches and returns of all sorts. And we have legal obligations to make sure we do our exploration in safe ways. Um, the second part of my talk is to look look ahead at the kind of issues we bump into. And I use bump into because, as I said, I didn't start out to study this. I was asked to take a look at questions about bringing back samples from Mars. If we bring back samples, what do we bump into in terms of environmental impact statements? Uh, what federal agencies do we work on, work with? What are the international implications? Um, just what might become problematic? And my first research was to look at how do we look ahead and try to avoid the problems by either doing research or making sure that we are attentive to administrative procedures or legal requirements. And so that's part of the research that goes into preparing for a mission. And on something like sample return, we will be looking at those. We're looking at them liter literally decades ahead. So that part is where I'm finding now that it's speeding up. We are finding issues that we're bumping into more and more and more, and the scientist alone even the scientists and the lawyers can't address them. We have to all come together. So first, let me step back, and some of you may not know what astrobiology is, but the current context for extraterrestrial extra searches is in the field of astrobiology, which is only a little over a decade old. There has been, of course, astronomy, or looking for extraterrestrial life, and lots of things where we've looked beyond Earth, but the astrobiology scientists from many different disciplines came together in the late 1990s and said, what is it that keeps us together? 
Uh, how do, does a paleontologist or a microbiologist or an ecologist or an astronomer or a cosmologist, you name it, how do we come together to explain all of what it is that we're looking at? And the questions that we ask are put together in uh, what's called a roadmap that looks at the origin, evolution, distribution, and fate of life in the universe. Basically, it's got three major questions. Where, does, where do we come from? Where does life come from? At what point do we go from the organic and inorganic material out there in inter interstellar space and become a replicating system? That's a scientist's definition of the uh, origin of life. Are we alone? It turns out that all the life that we know of in the universe is here on Earth. We don't know of any place else that has life. Is all life like us or not? Um, are we some sort of transient feature or will we be here for a very, very long time? And then the question, what's our future? What is our future on uh, Earth and in space? And so it, when we are searching for life, there are multiple methods. We're using, um, looking for evidence of life. I don't have to see life to know that there is life. If I looked at this room when it was empty, I would know something made all these seats. If I um, see a footprint, or a wormhole, or get a fossil, or see a smoke signal, or a flashing mirror, there are many different ways I can look for evidence of life. And what I'm looking for is life and life-associated processes. And I look every place I can, so that means places here on Earth as well as afar, and I use all the sciences that I can to look at it. So the astrobiology story stretches all the way back from those um, primordial organisms that we think came out of the, you know, the primordial soup or that warm pond long ago, but we go further than that. How did the stuff come here? Where did, what's the origin of the chemical elements? How did stars come about? How did planets come about? How did habitable conditions arise on individual planets? What is it about us that we need in terms of an environmental set of conditions? And what are the extremes of life as we know it? So astrobiology a asked all those questions together, and in the far right upper corner, you can see that when you look at Earth and life on Earth, it's a pretty um, recent phenomenon. When you think about from Big Bang onward, Big Bang 13 some billion years ago, and human um, life is pretty recent. It's down at the 11th hour of a, uh, of a 12 hour clock. So when we're asking, we're asking questions that go all the way across all of those scientific questions. And where would you start if you're going to look for life? Where do you think is a good place to begin? Because the universe is a very, very large place in space and time. So for those of you who are not astronomers, um, I'll tell you my biologist framework that put things in context for me when I began working on this. And to the astronomers, please forgive me for my simplicity. I actually got this out of a children's book. If, all, if you thought about all the stars in the universe as being represented by a grain of sand, the first grain of sand would be our sun, our star, and the solar system that goes with it. Second grain of sand would be 4.2 light years away. And if we go out at night and see the starlight that, um, from this, the nearby star, it would have started out over four years ago. By rocket ship, it, you could get there in about 100,000 years. Obviously, we've never been there. So all of the stars in <clears throat> our home galaxy, the Milky Way, would uh, take a construction size wheelbarrow. All of the stars actually in, on a good starry night would take a thimbles full of sand. And all of the stars in the known universe would take Railroad hopper cars filled with sand, one per second, 24 hours a day, for three years. When we do missions, we're on the first grain of sand. We have now visited all the planets in some form or another, but um, that's where we're starting. We, we're not even going into the backyard. We haven't even got, gotten off the porch. So all of our searches for life are within the galaxy, and just a portion of that as well. And in the the nature of the kind of evidence we're looking for and the methods we're using, there are three categories of searches that are going on now. There's the steady searches, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There are searches for extrasolar planets, 
planets that are out around other stars, however far they may be. Um, hopefully, maybe even some Earth-type Earth planets that are habitable. And then there's the search within the solar system. And that was previously called exobiology before it was all pulled together. So let me go through the search types and tell you why it is that I'm looking in the solar system. So the SETI searches, and SETI Institute was originally set up as a group of radio astronomers in the early 90s when Congress said we shouldn't use tax money to look for little green men. And so a group of people got together and said it was a significant enough question to ask about life out there that they wanted to keep it going. Scientifically, it was very valuable. And the radio astronomers are the ones that do that. They're searching within the galaxy. If they find life with a, by receiving a message on one of their radio telescopes, they would know that that life is intelligent. Something had to build technological devices in order to send a signal that we could receive. A hundred years ago, 150 years ago, this planet would not be detectable for intelligent life. So if we get a signal, that's because we didn't, don't have, uh, didn't have the control over radios and TVs and telescopes and whatnot. So a hundred years ago, we had intelligent life on this planet, but it would not be detectable. If the SETI folks find and verify a signal they don't have to understand what the signal's saying. I can pick up a phone and hear someone speak in Russian, and I don't speak Russian. I know that there's a signal. That's not noise. So think of the SETI searches as something like a message machine. I can get a message. I know someone's sending me a message, talking to me. They're intelligent enough to talk to me. Um, that's verifiable extraterrestrial life. They are unknown biology. I can't tell you anything about what they look like, whether they're good or bad, what their metabolism is. So the biologist can't address that question. They may, they're probably so far away that I don't even know if they still exist. They'd be tens or hundreds or thousands of year, light years away, probably tens at this point. And that's what you sort of think of as aliens. So if SETI gets a signal, that's nice. It affects our psyche and uh, maybe raises other questions that are important, but it doesn't do anything else. Then we've got extrasolar um, habitable planet searches, and that's the Kepler mission. That's a um, telescope that's out there saying, if there are um, so many stars, could they also have planetary systems around them? And most stars could not, um, the stars are so bright, you couldn't see planets around them until someone figured out the method of detecting the wobbles, the gravitational tug between the planet and the star. And then later, the transit, a planet going in front of the star causing a dimming of the light. And it was only in around 1995 where people began to start to look for the wobble and then later on for the transits. And the Kepler telescope that's up right now and just had its mission extended has now found hundreds of uh, candidate planets, some of which are s the size of Earth, some of which have interesting chemical atmospheres. So what we're looking for is, is something the right distance from its sun, its star, so that there could be liquid water on it, might have habitable conditions. So what we would detect in that case is, is it habitable, not is it inhabited? But it still would be a very important thing. And again, that one could be light years, or is likely to be light years away, and we don't know if there's life on it. But it would give us a location where we could start really homing in on the studies. What I work on is called exobiology or astrobiology in the solar system. We can use multiple different ways of going up and looking for life. We can use missions. We visit other planets or moons or anything we want to. We can wait for things to fall here. We can study meteorites. So we can tell something about fossil life. We can study the um, chemistry of interstellar and interplanetary space and look for the processes that might lead to replication. Or we can even work on replication in a laboratory, see if you can con uh, create the conditions and get more complex molecules. And that is very similar to what's going on with synthetic biology. So all of these together are very similar to the kind of work that geologists do, biologists do, chemists do. And if you think about it, if I find life on Mars or in the solar system, 
it's real time. Okay, it's maybe a half hour for a message to get to Mars. It is pretty far away, but that's real time. If I find life up there, I know it's life. There's a potential for cross-contamination. If I want to bring that life here, or if I send a dirty spacecraft, I'm shifting microbes between the two locations. And then there's legal questions. Could it be biohazardous if I bring it back? So what we're doing is building on what we know as we go out and search in nearby places. Now, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, in the field of astrobiology and everything that's come into it, we've got real significant changes in understanding, and it's happening very, very rapidly. So we have a different understanding of the universe, its size, its uh, length of uh, time that it's been around. We know a whole lot more about planetary dynamics, and we're getting out and seeing bodies that we could only see from Earth before. We know about the solar system and Earth in a different way. We know about life and its role on Earth differently than before. I just think about it was only at the same time as Sputnik that the double helix was uh, deciphered. So we only knew about um, DNA as a hereditary material at about the beginning of the space age. So this is happening very quickly. And we have a different view in recent years, very recent years, of the taxonomy of life. Um, long ago, people used to talk of the tree of life with uh, humans up on top and animals and then plants. And, and it's very, very different now. The domains of life, we know that there are three basic microbial, or three domains of life. And what we think of as the top, we are just a little extreme. And most of life on this planet is microbial. And what we've got is this view of environmental microbiology. Now we recognize we're talking about that. Molecular biology, environmental biology, it all starts to fit together. And it's an altered view. We don't think of our planet as just this location on which life lives. It's a biogeochemical location that's working all the time. You've got chemically, chemical cycles. You've, and in fact, you have plate tectonics. So you have grand scale changes of life. Um, and things get covered over and started all over again. Life can live in extreme places. We know that now. We can find life on this planet in uh, deep subsurface locations. We can find it in very, very hot locations, salty locations, frosty locations. You can even find life living in the uh, microbes living in the cooling ponds of radio uh, ra nuclear power plants. How can these organisms live there in the cooling ponds with all that radioactivity? But they can. So what we're saying is, gee, if it can live here, when we look at these other locations, if those locations have conditions, environmental conditions, like what we have here on Earth, then they could be habitats for life. They could be habitable. So the definition of habitability really traces back to life as we know it. Um, but that gives us a lot of places that could be habitable. And what we also have is this leapfrog of science and technology, where the scientists are coming up with an idea and then the technologists can build something, a technology that gets you down to nanoscale or up to literally universal um, distances, and you start to be able to see things that you didn't see before. Think about until people had really fine microscopes. We didn't know about prions. We didn't know about viruses. And so until people had that, uh, Columbus didn't know about the germ theory of disease. Couldn't see it, didn't know about it. So all of that's going on together. So to put it together with astrobiological searches, what we're saying is we're looking for extraterrestrial life in the solar system. We're focusing on biological potential and habitability. And this is where you bump into issues. We're asking, does the target body that you're going to with your spacecraft have potentially habitable conditions based on life as we know it? Could it have extraterrestrial life either now or something that was in the past. Because if it was in the past, we can find the biomarkers of it. And if you think of something like Mars, Mars and Earth were formed at about the same time as planets. We know that on Earth, life came about very quickly, within the first billion years. And unfortunately, we have plate tectonics. So some of the rocks that we go to, to look, or fortunately or unfortunately, the rocks that we're looking at are 3.8 billion years old, and that's about the oldest ones we can get. Mars doesn't have plate tectonics on the scale that we do. And so that means that if Mars and Earth had similar past conditions, which they did, if Mars maybe had liquid water, which it probably did, 
then Mars and Earth were coming along as planets at about the same time. So if there were life that arose on Mars, we'd be able to find it, possibly, because the planet is uh, not growing over what's up there. And if we look on Mars, what we're looking for is the study of rocks. We're, we're looking first at the rocks that are up there for evidence of life itself. We're searching for liquid water because life needs liquid water, life as we know it. And we're looking for other clues. When we breathe, you, we have a chemistry that's detectable in our breath. Mars has some unusually um, odd places where methane exists. Could that methane be biologically generated? Methane on Earth can be from volcanoes, but it could also be from cows or bad stomach. So if we detect something like that, does that gas, for instance, give us a place to look? Could you find life under the surface in a cave? So it's starting to build things like that. So that strategy of going and looking in places that might be habitable is what's worked on Mars. And we've gone to Mars, so 1976. We went to Mars with the Viking missions and landed on two sides of the planet. Those spacecraft lasted up there for two years. We did not see any life up there, but we did see a lot of other things and realized there were, uh, it was a somewhat active planet, but it didn't succeed in showing that there's life. We went back again in 1996 with the small Pathfinder rover. That was about the time we had also found that meteorite from the Antarctic that seemed to have potentially fossilized life inside it. Then we went again in 2003 with the rovers, the Opportunity and Spirit that are still going on up there now. And in 2007, we landed near the poles on Mars, the icy poles, and um, that the Phoenix mission actually dug into the, the ices. And this summer, 2011, the Mars um, Science Lander is going to land and it will be able to rove and visit a lot more sites. To give you a sense of how things have changed, the 1996 rover was about the size of a um, microwave oven. The 2003 ones that are still operational, uh, they're about the size of a golf cart. And the Mars um, Smart, Land, Smart Science Lander is MSL, the one that will land, is the size of a car. So we can row further, dig deeper, and do a lot more things. And as I said, one of the things we're looking for is indications of water. We know that Mars has the <laughs> chemistry. We've been there many times. We know it has potential heat sources. It has um, volcanoes. Uh, the largest volcano in the um, solar system is actually on Mars. So we said, is there any evidence of water on Mars? Well, it turns out there is. We can find gaseous water and we can find frozen water. It's at the um, sublimation point, so you don't find liquid water, at least on the surface. But look at the indications of water that we have. The top, the 70s, in the Viking missions, we found essentially a dew that would settle. That was ice on the surface, not liquid water, but it would come and go during the days. We see snow accumulations, and we know on Earth, when you have deep snow pack, you can have pressure, and then you can get kind of a meltwater beneath. And if you look beneath these ice areas, it's an awful lot looking like water flows and cause the erosion. The bottom one here, recent gullies, they can go over locations that look very um, eroded and come over more recently and find them darkened like this. Like there could be permafrost with melted uh, water. Although it could just be a slump of some sort and it's just a darkened uh, sediment underneath, so we don't know that for sure. Here we've got gullies and landslides that look to me like any of the hillsides around S San Francisco Bay. We have bore before and after meteor impacts and we can actually see the ice. We know that's uh, frozen ice that sublimates. We can see glacial size features and we also have polar ices that are kilometers thick. So we have plenty of indications of liquid water, I mean of uh, large scale indications of frozen water on Mars. We also have small-scale indications of water on Mars. So when the, the Spirit and Opportunity went up there, they looked for hematite. Actually, this is a hematite. It's a mineral that is formed in the presence of liquid water here on Earth. And what they found is these hematite blueberries. They were able to see it first from on orbit, and then they used that information for lots of hematite to select the landing sites where they did find these. These are about the size of a small BB. They also found sedimentary layers. 
the, uh, in the far right picture, you can see the um, little rounded kind of uh, terracotta colored uh, discs. Those are places where the, um, the instrument was actually able to grind in, sand away the surface materials and get down to see what the mineralogy was like. And what they found repeatedly up there in this mission and subsequent missions is um, sedimentary layers, obviously associated with water, salty water by the minerals that are there, and um, association with a watery past on Mars. So we're finding locations that indicate that Mars had a, a, a past that was completely dominated with water. We also can see a lot more present day conditions where it's not a dead planet, it's actually doing a lot of things. On the far left you can see 2008 active landslides, landslides coming down, so those gullies, whatever's going on, there are things that are um, processes that, are, that we can recognize. Moving dunes, here this one, 2010, if you watched over time, you could see this dune front move, so there's a lot of wind up there too. This one here, dust devils, 12 miles high, just this was February of this year. So the orbiting spacecraft is looking down and can actually follow the wind. And then here, you can start to see the the fine resolution that we're getting, we can really resolve things even from on orbit and we're m doing much better when we're down on the surface. So the astrobiologists that are searching for life up on Mars or any place in the solar system would love to get samples back. Much like when we got samples back from Apollo, we were getting a lot of information that could help us fill out that picture about the birth of the moon and our, our own planet. We're looking for signs of water and ice. Um, we know that Earth and Mars had similar past. There's no plate tectonics on Mars. And we now, we only have had up until now remote data, data that's come to us from the spacecraft or from meteorites. And we are getting better and better at going to more places. So the scientists want the real thing. They'd love to get samples back. This is where planetary protection comes in. In searching for life up there, we want to make sure that we don't do anything to interrupt any evolution or any life that's up there. And so this is where we think about avoiding past mistakes. If you want to think about it, we're going to another planet to look for life. We're looking to a new world and what it might have. When Columbus went to the new world, he did not understand the germ theory of disease, but more Ameri Native Americans were killed by the diseases that were spread than by any shooting or other um, mis displacement. And it turns out that planetary protection and thinking about these things before you go up for a mission is a lot like doing an environmental impact assessment here on Earth. And you're really, the concept you're working with is exotic species. You don't want to bring in something that could infect you, could impact the environment, um, or otherwise cause harm. So you're minimizing hitchhikers on your spacecraft is basically what it is. And the reason that we do it is an outer space treaty that traces back actually to the time of Sputnik. The biologist at the time of Sputnik realized that by being able to get escape velocity and leave Earth, you could send on your spacecraft something that would mess up your science. They were thinking about it in terms of the science. Could you go up there and find something that you brought by mistake? Could you get a false positive? So you want to avoid that. So the Outer Space Treaty actually has a part in it that speaks directly to avoiding harmful cross-contamination of the planets and avoidance of adverse effects on Earth. So that means you think about forward contamination as you're preparing a spacecraft and backward contamination. You don't want to have hitchhikers either way. So it doesn't mean we can't bring back samples from outer space, but it means that if you bring them back, you've got to bring them back in a way that would be um, safe and would adhere to all the health and environmental laws that we have here on Earth. So the question is, how do you take that treaty discussion and sort of think about thou shalt have clean air or clean water in the laws? How do you take a clean water um, statement from a Clean Water Act and turn it into something that engineers can design for? Is it swimmable water? Is it fishable water? Is it drinkable water? Who do you use as your standard? Are you using people who are immunosuppressed? Are you thinking about 
elderly or children or the average person, whoever that is. So in order to take a treaty statement or a legal statement and put it into something that you can operationalize, you've got to start to do tests and you've got to set standards based on science. And the National Academy of Sciences has said, if you're doing this, you must do it in a conservative way. We don't know if there's life on another planet, but if you bring things back, you don't want to make any mistakes. So assume there is and design things accordingly. So constantly we're revising our plans based on the up updated science. Right now, um, all of our one-way missions, our robotic missions, are pretty much routine. We know how to do it. We know how to spend, send spacecraft. Whether it's an orbiter, um, a lander, or instruments, it depends on where you're going and what you're doing. If you go to the moon, there's no life on the moon. We know that. When they went to the moon, they were careful about what they did. And they were put all the lunar rocks into containment when they came back. So when you go to the moon, you don't have to do as much planetary protection control as you do when you go to a place like Mars where we don't know if there's life. We have to be careful to protect the science and we have to be um, careful to protect the planet especially ours. So the controls that are done, this is a photograph of the, um, the Pathfinder rover when it was being packed up. And the, it's all done in clean rooms that are cleaner than electronics clean rooms. And so we sterilize and clean all the components and when they stack a spacecraft and get it built, they check it and if it's not clean enough, they take off the part and re-clean it. So there's a real a lot of thousands of assays that are done on these spacecraft. And the Viking spacecraft, when it went in the 70s, the entire spacecraft was put into a room size um, oven and heated for several days. We also have a lot of documentation. So the NASA and the Europeans and other nations who are launching spacecraft actually document what is on there. There, there are allowable numbers of microbes that can go, but they're very, very low. And all that information is given to the United Nations. We avoid recontamination, so when you clean your spacecraft, it's all sealed up so that there's no more contamination on the way. Uh, we keep an in inventory of any organics that are used in the materials, so you start right away from the design of the spacecraft because detection of organics is really important for the scientist as well as for life. And there's also questions about end of mission. When you're launching something, say when they went to Jupiter, with the Galileo mission, they hadn't known about Europa, the, the icy moon with the thick crust and the salty ocean. So what they said is at the end of the mission, when the spacecraft was going to crash, they wanted to have it crash into Jupiter so that it couldn't possibly crash later on into Europa and perhaps melt through the icy crust and get down to the salty ocean. So planetary protection goes right from the beginning when you're starting to plan the mission and the hardware all the way to the end of the mission. We also consider round trip missions. So this robotic sample return probably won't happen until after two, 2020. Bringing samples to Earth is something we know how to do. We've done it with a number of missions, starting back with Apollo. Um, in this case, we're talking about launching 500 grams of, or bringing back 500 grams of material that would fit inside of a coffee, coffee cup. Uh, the round trip to Mars would take three years. And um, the planning for the mission would take over 10 years. What we have to think about on planetary protection, it's not just getting back the samples, but also thinking about environment, health, and safety regulations here on Earth, with the concept being uh, exotic species. We would have to build um, a biocontainment and quarantine lab. NASA's committed to building a biosafety level four lab, the strictest, um, most um, highly controlled labs on, on Earth. We'd have to also worry about cleanliness. When you think about it, the, um, the glove boxes that are used during a mission or during handling of um, materials, if you want to make sure that you're um, performing good biocontainment, what you need to have is negative pressure inside the glove box. So if there's any leakage, it goes in. But a planetary scientist wants to think about positive pressure. If you've got valuable samples in there, you want to keep them pristine. So if there's any leakage, you want the leak to go out, to keep positive pressure. So when they bring these samples back, they'll have to do both. Um, we'll have to build a sample receiving lab someplace. It does not exist right now. And um, develop handling and testing protocols. 
And this is what's sort of fun here. Um, it took six work, five workshops to start to talk about what are you going to do if the samples came back tomorrow, are we prepared to handle them? And if you start and think about the protocol, you have to think about number one, how are you going to contain it? And then how are you going to open it? What kind of data do you want to, um, to mark down and record? When you are handling these things, you want to set aside some for straight science uh, research, so you have to have pristine storage and curation. Then you want to start to look at the physical and chemical tests, number three. Um, what kind of tests would you do on these samples as they come back? In what order to make sure you do the non-destructive ones first and have the least use of samples? Then you want to look at four. Can you detect life in it? Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you're looking for little monkeys. You're looking for biochemical signatures. And then you still would want to do biohazards test. Even if there's no life in it, could there be anything in there that would be a hazard to life on Earth? And all of that together is have, has to be incorporated with environment health and safety monitoring to assure the public that the lab is OK and operating. You'd have to have um, a a, a whole set of decisions made on when is it okay to let these samples out, just like we did with the moon. When do you move from information and data to a statement that these are okay to move out to scientific labs all around the world? So we're also asking these same questions about other locations. So for instance, Europa, I mentioned, the moon of, um, moon of Jupiter that has odd, an odd icy covering that has organics in it and looks like there's pa um, communication between the watery ocean and the surface. In addition, because it's there at Jupiter, there's a tremendous gravitational tug between the, the moon and the body. And so there's a, a thermal heating from the inside, a geothermal heating. So now we've got a warm set of conditions. We've got liquid water, a salty ocean like we had and we've got an energy source. We've got all the things we need for life. And now what they've found recently is this bottom one here, they're actually finding small lakes within the icy crust, liquid lakes that are in the icy crust. And as I said, a lot of uh, organic material in these cracks, very large cracks. So that means that there's a possibility of um, movement of materials from the surface to down below. We also have interest now in Enceladus, a moon of um, Saturn that wasn't really, had never been flown closely to. And if you see in the far right, there's some blue stripes. They call them tiger stripes. They're in an odd place. They were warm. They're down by the poles. Usually you'd expect the equatorial regions to be warm. And when they flew by, the top rainbowy picture, when they flew by, uh, this is some number of years ago now, they actually fought, saw on this 300 kilometer size moon um, materials being ejected out into space about 150 kilometers. And it was organic material and um, ice crystals. And this one here, a more recent one, where they actually went through the plumes and sampled. And that just happened in March, March 27th of this year. So these spacecraft missions go up there and they keep returning to places that look interesting. So what we're doing within astrobiology and with planetary protection in mind is keep looking to try to understand the universe one part at a time. And as astrobiologists, if we find life out there, what that will say is we do live in a biological universe. And if we find it in one place, it's as good as opening up all others. What would it mean about life? Now we get to something, I can tell you what it means scientifically, but what does it mean if all of a sudden we've got a second genesis of sorts? The other people have, the scientists are the ones that are making the decisions about missions. We're doing it consistent with the law. And all of these other questions just keep coming up but have not been dealt with seriously. And so we're starting to think about implications as we go forward. And that's why the kinds of questions that you ask here are so interesting and um, ha need to be addressed. Where we are now in astrobiology, it's astrobiology and exploration, and we try to do responsible exploration. But we're in an era where we could discover life, definitely could. So we have to recognize that what we're talking about is science in the real world, and we need to keep a very broad perspective. We've, we're playing out in this country science in a democratic process. The laws and the rules that we look at 
are about how we should do science. There's an uncertainty in making decisions. We're never 100% sure. And we can anticipate that there will be controversy. Some people would say, just don't do it. Don't bring samples back. And there was a group that tried to stop, already start to uh, mobilize against a Mars sample return mission a while ago. So NASA and the space nations have done a great job. Really, they have. They've been thinking about the conservative approach. And there's nothing that they're proposing that is outrageously risky. There are risks, but there are risks walking across the street. So we know that this information is not the kind of thing you can pick up in a textbook. It will come to you through the newspapers, the internet, and movies and whatnot. So it's important to think about the science that we're doing, which is very much where the scientists fit and others fit. And if you look down at the bottom here, we need to distinguish the basic sciences. That's what astrobiology science of what I was talking about. Is there life out there? What's its future? What is habitability? How do stars form? But then the applied science. We take that information and use it to make decisions. And that's made, those decisions are made in the context of, in our case, a democratic society with our laws. And then there are implications. There are implications of social justice just from the fact that we're spending money to go look for life out there. So all of these things come together. So scientists can be involved in the process, in the basic science, in the applied science, or thinking about the societal impacts and the significance. So there's a group of us who are basically scientists who are saying we need to think about these issues before we do them. And the Outer Space Treaty asks us to do that as well, to address the concerns in advance what we're seeing is that we want to continue this responsible exploration, but we have to anticipate what the ramifications might be, all of them, many kinds. As I said, much of what we're doing is very routine, but until now, the decisions have all been made by the scientists and the lawyers, and we're seeing issues that are going beyond just that. And all laws, all ethical systems, and um, all theologies are based on life as we know it. We are dealing with a science that is going into the next place. So is synthetic biology. So perhaps is nanotechnology. So astrobiology is almost like a, a way to frame some of these issues that we're dealing with as sciences move forward. So the question is, can we systematically address the issues before they arise? Um, how would we know what is right? Who should be involved in the decision making? What issues do we take up in what order? Are these things unprecedented, or can we borrow from existing systems? Um, like navigation law helped inform aviation law, and aviation law helped inform space law. So we're, we can borrow. There's a lot of things. Some things are helpful, and some are l literally um, unprecedented. So where do we start? Well, one place you could start is good literature, fiction. So, but we probably don't want to do that. But War of the Worlds, it ends with bacteria. So there was, in the 1990s, there were laser weapons, and the uh, Martians didn't take over Earth because they were overcome by our bacteria. Michael Crichton talked about, this was at the time of Apollo, and he wrote the book about microbes from space. Now, it was military that brought them back, and it was only from Earth orbit, not further out. But he wrote in his book, this is in the preface of the book in January 69. I think it is important that the story be told. This country supports the largest scientific establishment in the history of mankind. New discoveries are constantly being made, and many of these discoveries have important political or social overtones. In the near future, we can expect more crises on the pattern of Andromeda. Basically, the microbes ate through the, the gaskets and got out, and people were dying. Um, I believe it is useful for the public to be made aware of the way in which scientific crises arrive and are dealt with, 1969. And so that's the kind of thing we, we as a collective public need to consider. So what is the impact of the science upon um, that, that we're doing? What is the impact upon society? And what is society and care about what it is that we're doing? And they could also stop us. So how do you think about it both ways? So possible quick exper examples I want to give you. You don't need science fiction to anticipate it. it. We have ethics issues about life already and life on Earth and beyond. Plans of what to do when we discover extraterrestrial life. 
commercial and private uh, activities that are becoming real problematic or questionable at this point, questions about living in space, and even planetary defense. So what if we find extraterrestrial life? We're spending all this time looking for it. The question is, <laughs> what do we do when we get it? It's like the dog catching the truck, and then, now what do I do? Um, the Outer Space Treaty is written in such a way as to make sure that while we're searching, we do it responsibly. And there, we use science and technology to address that. But if there's extraterrestrial life, what would that mean? There is no policy right now for if we would discover life on Mars. There's no policy about what to do if we discover life in a glove box here on Earth, or if an astronaut picks up a sample someday when we have human missions. So we've actually held some workshops, and we brought ethicists in. So the Committee on Space Research, the group that advises the international community and the UN, has had a workshop on ethics and planetary protection. What do we do about environmental management, the ethics of environment out there? What do we do if we find life? Is, do we just protect science, or should we think about protecting life? What do we do when we go to locations that don't have life, like the moon? How do you distinguish a location? Everything we do on Earth is environments with life. Out there, we've got environments without life. So what are the standards you, sh you should use? If we define, find life, what about interacting with it? What would it mean to interact with other beings? As I said, SETI in, the SETI principles were set by astronomers on what they should do if you discover life. We don't have anything like that for microbial life. And so we've held some inter interdisciplinary workshops where we've gotten people together and said, what are the big societal questions about discovering life, about doing some of the science that we're doing? And we've tried to develop a roadmap of astrobiology societal issues that complement the, the science questions. Looking beyond the science, we have already things like the Google Lunar X Prize. The, the X Prizes are to incentivize commercial groups. And in 2007, the X Prize put up 30 million bucks for the first private sector spacecraft to go to the moon and an additional $5 million bonus if you would go to and document a uh, human heritage site, either a Russian one or an Apollo site. The question is, what does that mean? These people are looking at these, awarding these prizes. These folks, the SpaceX, the Lunex, and others, are really um, putting together viable programs and launching things. There are 26 uh, companies that are active participants for this $30 million prize. And there are those who are putting together business plans for commercial delivery. I can fly a rocket and you can put your science instrument on it, or your mining in instrument, or your other experiment. I'll be a FedEx Lunex to take you to the moon. And they're doing it in such a way as to have it um, with spacecraft, like a spacecraft bus. You can get a seat on our delivery vehicle. There's other um, enterprises that are for real, um, people who are proposing astro burials, $10,000 and you can ship your ashes up to the moon. Strip mining and resource extraction, for real. Um, space synthetic biology, if you want to build something on the moon, you can send up all the construction material or you could send up microbes, mine the water, and use the lunar soil. You've got adobe, you can build things. So can you use synthetic biology in a way to get things out? Well, a lot of the questions about the private sector include things like, um, should we preserve the human sites up there? Is the footprint an artifact? Do we preserve everything up there or just some sites? Who regulates it? We don't have, it's the, uni the, um, the US or the launching nation owns the hardware up there, but they don't own the land on which it sits. And there is no inter international planetary protection police or any kind of other um, enforcement. Um, should we designate some areas as pristine or wild uh, wilderness areas, as some people have proposed? Um, what if a celestial body like the moon is sacred to the Navajo? Is it a bad thing to, uh, to have the nations that are spacefaring setting the rules in, uh, to basically keep out others who have some thought about it? Or when we plan these missions, are we thinking also about future generations? Is there anything that we'd be doing for them? Um, so we're having to ask all those questions as we go forward. Then there's the whole question of human missions. 
We know we've gone to the moon. If, if there were life on the moon, we would have it back here. We had humans on the moon, and we didn't know about microbiology the same way, although we did quarantine the samples and the astronauts very well when they came back. But we know there's been changes in laws, there's been changes in, in science and in technology, and now there's changes in public involvement. And so if we send people up there, we have to think about humans as cross-contaminators, which we are. For every cell in your body, you have 10 microbes. It's an order of magnitude more microbes than cells in your body. We, up until now, have been doing years, decades of orbital research, and spacecrafts and everything we have are built for orbit. We have to start all over again and build designs for planetary spacecraft, planetary um, space suits, rovers, everything. And um, there were real problems even after one or two weeks on the lunar surface. If they had gone much longer, the space suits wouldn't have worked because of all of the dusts that were a problem. So we have to think about how we plan all these things and keep it as responsible <coughs> exploration. And even the questions about um, how many days it takes. It would be over 500 days for a round trip mission to, to Mars. And they just did a study where some, some astronaut volunteers stayed 500 days in a capsule over in um, Russia to simulate what it would be like to be separated from the Earth for that long. So they used time delay, they had special foods, they uh, simulated as much as they could without microgravity or anything to just see what the issues are. And there are many. When you're two weeks away from Earth, Earth doesn't look like a nice blue marble. It looks like another star. It's just a body out there. So that isolation from people is a real important thing. And so to prepare for missions like that, we have to consider not only protecting Mars, protecting the crew, but protecting Earth. And there are all sorts of things that go into it. Waste disposal, food, building sites, um, how do you move around up there, and you still have to think about planetary protection. So the biggest issues that we know and we've discussed in workshops are things like uh, how do you get the water that they're using? How about it, food or air? A lot of our um, uh, life support systems depend upon microbes. Well, do you put them up there, and how would you tell them apart from an extraterrestrial microbe if that was the issue? Um, and so we're, we're beginning to integrate all of this together to think about how you would allow for human missions to go up there. And all of this together over the long term, we're starting to talk about human-directed evolution. We've got migration beyond Earth. People are talking about going out there. What happens to mutation? Do you end up with a different species of human over some time? How long? What are our obligations to the humans on Mars that are fully two years away? Launch Launch times can only be every two years based on the way the planets move. So what does that mean? What are our obligations to those humans afar? We have life support on this planet, but it's natural life support, not artificial life support. And we do not send anybody away, whether it's to uh, offshore oil rigs or submarines or anything else for the lengths of time that we're talking about for missions. So astrobiology is then bumping into other fields. So things like transformations of mind and body, um, autonomous robots that'll do things for people. We've got liability questions about that. Synthetic biology, nanotechnology, deliberate evolution. We're making decisions about how humans will go if we start sending people off planet. And there are even people that are talking about hybrids, robot, human hybrids, and transhumans. So how does that fit into life and its future? And the final question is one that the astronomers also have found out only in the past couple decades the idea of planetary defense from hazardous asteroids. It's the ultimate threat to life because we know that things are constantly raining in from the, the meteors uh, this, and the, the dust that come through, the things that we call meteor showers, um, to a good-sized meteorite that could hit a car and ruin it, all the way to things like a uh, building-sized one that comes on the order of once a thousand years or so. And we had one of those in Tanguska which is in Siberia in 1908, and it flattened an area that would be uh, the equivalent to flattening all of Manhattan or Washington, D.C. So although n those aren't super uh, damaging, if you land in an area with high density, that's a problem. And then you have the KT mass extinction 65 million years ago, a mountain-sized um, asteroid that literally wiped out the dinosaurs. Some astronomers are saying, 
this could wipe out life. It could wipe out civilization as we know it on this planet. So do we do anything about it? And what should we do? And it turns out that um, we don't have a plan. We know how to detect them, and we started detecting them more during the 1990s. We're continuing to look for the really big ones and asking how they could impact us or whether they would have an Earth-crossing orbit. Um, the smallest ones could cause problems on the order of like a hurricane or a flood. And the largest ones, as I said, could end civilization. So it's an unusual mix of politics, science, military, and legal issues. Outer Space Treaty says no nukes in space, no military in space. We're starting to push into this dual use because Air Force worries about what's out there in space and space defense. Who should make the decisions? So we have programs in the US that are monitoring these asteroids. We have scientists and engineers who are saying, can we deflect them if we see them coming? And the answer is yes, if you start long enough ahead. You can push them gently with what's called the gravity tractor. Just keep pushing it. If you, uh, you could impact it with a conventional impactor, uh, just blow it up. But now you've made lots of little ones. Is that a problem? Or you could blow it up with a nuke, but now you're talking about dual use of space. So all of those are problems. And a group of astronauts, an international group of astronauts, went to the United Nations and said, we can detect them. We know how to deflect them. We've got the technology. We have no decision-making capability. There is nothing internationally. And this is the only natural disaster that is totally preventable. Anything else we can only mitigate. We can, you know, reduce the damage from floods by having people evacuate. We can talk about earthquakes. We can do things about fire. This one, an asteroid hit, we can turn it into a non-event if we deflect it. And you don't have to deflect it that much to get it to miss Earth. The problem is, if you make a mistake, now you've turned a natural disaster into a man-made disaster. And what are the criteria you would use? So you don't want it to come in on a high, you know, a high population density. Well, what if the Chinese decided to deflect and send it towards Los Angeles? And that may not be satisfactory. Or Costa Rica might not like the fact that it's coming there. So how do we develop something that would work for the entire globe and have the decision making and the funding and all of that go to it? So some are talking about we should think about literally the future of life on this planet and do kind of an insurance contribution by everybody. So these are legal proposals that get into very unusual areas. So astrobiology, kind of uh, as a science, it's very interesting because it's all incorporated in uh, encompassing about life. But it bumps into policies and issues that we really do have to think about. And we are thinking about them in the context of stewardship and responsible exploration. The answers are not yet set. Any of you that are in science or non-science have the potential to work on some of these issues. And we're starting with the notion of how do you reach out to other communities, non-science communities, and get them working together. So um, within the NASA Astrobiology Institute, there's actually a group that have put together a focus group on astrobiology and society. And part of what we're doing is this kind of thing, to reach out to people that are scientists and non-scientists. Scientists need to be aware that they're not making all the decisions. And when they want to involve others to help to make des decisions and to set policies, we have to make sure that they're informed about the astrobiology. So we're all in this together. We've got to work on it together. So that would be where we end up with astrobiology and, exp and exploration is really building on concepts and scientific understanding and trying to anticipate issues as we look forward. And I like this quote from Einstein, you can't solve a problem from the same consciousness that created it. You must learn to see the world anew. And I think astrobiology is doing a lot of that in many different locations. Thanks. Thank you.